You may all be seated. I like young people. I like <laughs> energetic. All right. First of all, like Reverend has said, we have known ourselves in the spirit for a very long time. <laughs> and we finally met in the flesh. In fact, what he said here, I mean, just for about five minutes, is so accurate. It resonated so much with me in the spirit. And as I was saying it, I remember the most powerful teacher, and I'm saying this, the most anointed teacher of the word of God I've ever met did not show up on radar. We walked into a meeting. We were not just like this, not more than 30, not about 20. He was teaching, and I've never felt that kind of anointing. And he just turned. I walked in, and he said, you, and by word of knowledge, things I'm doing today, he started calling it. This was in 1988. He, the gentleman today did just not, I don't even know where he is. I mean, you know, you can know where people are, and then I, I don't know where he is physically, all right? So it's, it's, it's something that um, is really strong. Now, so let me just say, in the light of all this, I will share four things as a young person. Four cardinal things that, now, all of you are or want to do ministry, right? Abby? Uh -huh. <laughs> let, let us get it straight. Or serve the Lord. Now, I'll show them, I'll show them, I'll show them what I'm But you want to be plugged in, okay? So there are four things that you have to embrace. And I explain them. Number one, you must have a set man or set men who constantly feed you with insights into the scripture. And every day, and I explain this, you must listen to them for at least one hour. Number two, personally, you must have what the old timers called quiet time. Where you will spend time personally praying, and I explain what you do there, and meditating on the word of God. Number three, you must not forsake the gathering of people together. Listen, let's remove the issue of offense. You come to church, you will get offended. So you don't, lead. listen, I've been in a meeting, you know, Sometimes people get angry now at pastors. I've been in a church where I was drinking deep of this minister and he, he fought with us that were going for campus fellowships, uh, that, were in campus, that nobody must go to campus and all of that. I didn't care. I would sit down. My friends stopped coming. I was taking notes. It was so bad one day he said, young man, come. After the meeting, he took me. He said, let me warn you. I've given you a long rope. You choose whose side you are. It didn't bother me. I came here because of what I'm drinking from you. All right? If you're angry, be, I, I, you know, there was nothing like offense. <laughs> I was here for revelation. I was still taking my notes, dodging that, listen, right? Which side if I'm saying, right? Because people trip over things that are not necessary in church. Okay? So you must not forsake and then I'll show you here, even though you, now, so that's the body. But secondly, you have to have a small group, which is like a cell, where you come together and pray together regularly. Nobody has become great that is not traceable to a cell. A small group, whether they did it consciously or unconsciously, whether it was organized or they just, but everybody once belonged to some small group. And I explained this, and they were praying. Character defects that will come much later up in your life that can trip your ministry and destroy you can be corrected if there's accountability in those small cells. That is what James was saying was confess your faults one to another 
and pray for one another that you may be healed. Anybody with a major character defect right, is visible did not tell that small cell what was going on for them to pray him out of it. Are you fancy? And number four, there's a difference between when you are called and when you are separated. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, I'm going to show this here. You can be called to sing. It doesn't mean the set man over you should give you the microphone to sing. You can be called to teach. And before you are separated to it, you are under authority. And what the authority says is what you do. So let's look at these five, four things here. Let me expand it from the scriptures here. Look at John chapter 4, and I'll start with this. John chapter 4 and verse 35. I just want to be sure it's 35. Just... All right, John 4, 34. Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the gathering of your people here and the mighty presence of your spirit that is evident in this place. I ask by the power of that same spirit you will grant utterance that I will speak as your oracle, that your word will go forth unhindered by any demonic force in simplicity but with accuracy and in power that light will shine upon our uh, lives and some deposit will be made into what is already going on in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Verse 35 is what I'm saying. He said, say not ye, there are yet four months and cometh the harvest. Don't say that there are four months, then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white and all ready to harvest. So don't say it's going to take four months. Uh, don't say it's going to take us 20 years to do certain things. He said, behold, they are white, all ready to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life. That both he that soweth, and he that reapeth, may rejoice together. Herein is that saying true. One soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap wherein you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you are entered into their labor. So when Jesus sends you, he sends you into fields that have already been labored in. Are you following what I'm saying? A calling into ministry is not a brilliant idea to do something. It is not an innovative thought to create something. It is to continue a work that has already started on the earth. When Moses was called, what Moses was going to do, God had revealed it into the heart of Abraham 400 years before Moses got the call. Now, it could have been like a call to Moses, but God had already told Abraham, he said, your seed will go into Egypt. They will be there for 400 years, and after that, they will come with great substance. So whatever God calls you to do is linked up, the truth is, so an uncompleted task in the spirit of somebody in the previous generation. In other words, when your work is being carried out, 
The same way Solomon finished the temple, that was the dream of David, somebody in the previous generation says, that was our dream we couldn't reach. The Bible says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He said, old men shall dream dreams. Young men will do what? See visions. If you read it in the Hebrew, a vision is an interpretation of a dream. So old men there, all right, will dream a dream. The coming generation will bring an interpretation. You know, when I was on campus, I was leading a fellowship. I didn't start the fellowship. But the fellowship went through a period of real crisis. I mean, this thing we're talking about where the pastor said, you know, it was real crisis. Finally, when I got into leadership, I, I got into it. And I became president of fellowship. Because there were many people, I don't know, what kind of point of doing it. But the person who started the fellowship, all right, said, let's leave this guy. Let him do what is inside this house. And I always felt this is what this fellowship is about. And I spent time praying. So that what I did was, will be a perfect interpretation of what was going on. And, and this, I mean, once I went to preach in a church in South Africa, I kept asking the person I invited me, I said, what's going on in this church? What's going on? He said, no, 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 just preach. I said, no, 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 no. They, they don't just preach. All right? You don't just say, they don't just invite you and you, I'm just telling the ministry and you go and preach. All right? You may know many things, but you are not adding to people if you are not interpreting the vision of the house. So he finally told me that, you know, they just struggled out. Over. I said, all right, I get what you're saying. So I went to pray. So that what I teach is an interpretation. You know, when it's an interpretation, it means somebody is articulating something that was inside me I couldn't voice out. And as I started teaching, a point came, the pastor got up, turned and faced the wall, and he was crying. And I knew I was accurate. That what I was doing there was interpreting that. So what God is looking for is one generation that will plant and another generation that will reap what they planted. That's why he says, I will turn the hearts of the fathers to children and the hearts of children. To if he can find one generation that will not criticize the previous one, but interpret, then that work can be complete. This is what he has been looking for. That if I can find a generation that will go into a field. In other words, what? because when they don't go into that field, we start all over again. And what should have been done in two years, we are doing it for 45 years. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what Jesus is saying here. Right? So it's important that you understand that you are going in, number one, to interpret something, all right? In fact, when the scripture says, and I'll give them the desolate, um, to, uh, what it says literally is, I will give them abandoned properties in the spirit. That means they are anointings that have been abandoned. Do you get what I'm saying here? They are inheritances that people have built up that have been abandoned by people, which means that you can say a man like John Gillick did something, it has been a, people are not interpreting those things again. All right? So don't let your gift blind you, do you get what I'm saying here, from what ministry is. Ministry there is that you are carrying an inheritance of a lineage. And you are, you are interpreting the fullness of it. You know, the, and if you check it, if you really go deep into it and check, you will find. And that's why when everyone was saying this, that's what made those people fall away. They were anointed. They were gifted. But the anointing made them feel, so, I'm telling you, some people were more anointed than their pastor, so to speak. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Listen, I stayed in two major churches. 
they never gave me the microphone to preach. Do you get what I'm saying here? I went to share in a fellowship near the church. When I finished, the man who was fellowship said, why haven't they given this man? That, now, now, Satan has come to tempt you. You should know what's going on. <laughs> because then you two get up and say, oh, I don't give my to pray here. I'm anointed here. <laughs> Let me tell you. I'll get to it. When you are called, you know, God said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I call them. So they were called, but there was a time they were separated. When he spat and anointed the eyes of that blind man, he was anointed. But he said, how do you see? He said, I see men as trees. In other words, you'll be anointed, but there'll be no real visibility. You won't know the steps to take. You would, everything, but you'll be preaching powerfully. Are, are you following me? Saying? Powerfully, but you won't see. Huh? At one time, I was preaching, and I said this when I got into ministry, and I felt I was anointed, so I would preach, preach. And I felt the more I teach, you know, the more you put the anointing out, the more people will know. So I used to teach what the Archbishop of Blessed Memory Delta is called everlasting gospel. Okay, Everlasting gospel means there is no time. When you start, when you stop is when you stop. I will preach to the point where the technicians there will say, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor. I will, I will look what's going Pastor, Pastor, Pastor. You have done 90 minutes. Tape, Pastor, tape. I will be like, okay, I'm done. Like, so they will bring last week's tape and record it. I won't stop. But nothing was happening. So I said, what's going on here? Until one day I went for a minister's conference in Dr. Dollar's church. And Kenneth Copeland came to speak, Brother Copeland. And he talked about faith and he talked about the anointing. Then I realized what I was trying to produce by the anointing, you get it by faith. And then I heard a voice tell me, if you will sit for three years and listen to what this man teaches, the size of your congregation will be three times what it is within the space of three years. Within the space of 18 months, we had moved from one service to five services, and we had tripled the size of the auditorium. But then, let me tell you how you therefore prepare to preach. If you are teaching on faith, look for the people who are experts on the subject of faith. First, they are there. Then when you go to the Bible, you give an interpretation. You see, finally I was invited to preach at the assistant pastor of Scripture Pastor the Church I started with back then. And when I finished preaching, the man did not know me. He said, uh, he called Pastor uh, Johnson He said, they said this young man used to be in our church. He said, yes. So he invited me to preach. I stood up. This was a shagat man. When I finished, the man got up. He took the mic. He said, if we started scripture pastor just to give birth to this ministry, we have done the work of God. But that was almost 27 years after. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> because when are you sent? Jesus now told the man, go and wash in that pool called Salo. Meaning sent. He washed. He said, how do you see now? He said, I see men clearly. In other words, there are people that are called and anointed, but have not yet been sent. And the problem is when your anointing starts disturbing you. Do you understand what I'm saying? To the point where you say, I am anointed to sing. I should be leading worship. And then they tell you, 
And this is where submission comes in. All right? And this is why strong leadership is good. Because strong leadership can look at an anointed person and say, you go and handle the cameras there. One day I was in a plane with Snatch. She was coming from South Carolina to play. So I asked her, I said, she said, oh, I just went to record my album and, you know, I, so I just calculated from the albums I had. So I said, oh, this must be your thought. She said, thought? Thought? She said, listen, the albums nobody had. <laughs> this is a sixth or seven. I said, are you serious? I said, yes. So I said, so I asked her a question. She said, let me tell you a story. She said, we were seven friends and we decided to relocate to England. I said, one day, Pastor Chris just looked at me and I said, we are going. I went to tell him we are going. The others just went. <laughs> he said, there's something on your life. Don't go. He said, stay back. I see something on you. She was in the choir. You know, they're singing now. She re he removed her from the choir. Took her to selling tapes. You are not yet separated, but you are called. You know what happens? He said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I've called them. When you have not yet separated, you will go to where God didn't send you because you can't see clearly. Pastor Joel Austin preached for the first time the same week his father went home to be with the Lord. That you are called to teach doesn't mean you must carry the mic. Do you get what I'm saying? It doesn't mean that you must be close. Are you following what I'm saying? Till today, the two main churches I attended, they've never invited me to preach. Till now. <laughs> Till now. In fact, when I was in school, Reverend Emiko told me, he said, haven't they recognized your anointing in this place? <laughs> Till now. But we have cordial relationships. Because I know that it takes strength for you to look at me and say, I'm still not inviting you. Do you get what I'm saying here? Are you following me? Let me tell you this. Yeah, because stories are good. I remember first time I ever invited Bishop Oedepo to come and preach in our campus fellowship. Ah, I've done the great thing. Bishop Oedepo has come. I was on cloud nine. <laughs> now, the reason is this. This is how it was. I went to invite him. His pastors told me there is a special session in the Bible school. Don't build your ministry on campus fellowship. He teaches it, so he won't come. I don't know what came on me. I pressed and invited. To cut long story short, he just asked me, said, you want me to come and preach for you? I said, yes. He said, all right, I'll give you the test. He said, who am I preaching with? I said, Reverend Emiko, he said, you will get Reverend Emiko. He said, if you get Reverend Emiko, I'll come. Ah. I said, leave that to me. <laughs> because Reverend Emiko's wife was trained by my father in medical school. So I knew where to go to pull Emiko. <laughs> that was no offense. He showed up. So this is where I'm going. The next Sunday, I took the head of intercession a leader of praise and worship, and one other person. Let's go to winners, to the church. They had just started then. There are very few. So at the end of the service, it just came out. I, chairman, I stood here. The worship leader stood here. Intercessory head stood here and somebody else. Bishop Redebu came, shook the lady, how are you? What's happening? God bless you. Shook the lady, how are you? God bless you. Shook the third person, how are you? God bless you. And walked away. <laughs> You can imagine the leader. The people I took could not talk. You know why they are embarrassed? <laughs> Say, my, you mean you are not? <laughs> but it was training. Are you following what I'm saying? You are not yet separated. You can't be treated as somebody who is separated you are still under authority where they need to tell you certain things. Yeah. 
So one, understand that your vision will be an interpretation of a dream. Spend time right there for making yourself available there. You are in this ministry here, the set man there. Right? There are things that are inside his heart God has deposited. Are you following me, saying? When you keep listening once every day, every day, I mean, you heard Reverend talk about Reverend Sudhir Jordan. Reverend Sudhir Jordan broke, when you say breakthrough, he broke through in this country first. Yeah. When you say breakthrough, all right? If you saw him any time, he was wearing headphones with a workman, listening, listening. He was known to have listened to some messages 400 times. So something was dropped into his spirit. So that's the first thing. Right? Kenneth Copeland said, when I started reading the Bible, I read it through the eyes of Kenneth Hagin until I understood how to read. And then the Holy Ghost began to show me things. Are you following what I'm saying? So you start that way. That's the first step. Then the second one is, right. Okay, look at Job chapter 8, verse 10. Oh, could I have forgotten that? Job chapter 8, quickly, verse 10. Job 8 and verse 10. Oh, okay, let's start from verse 6. Let me see. Job 8. All right. If thou pray, I shall wake up. Verse 7. Then it says this. Now, look at what it says here. Now, we quote this scripture, but hear what it says. Though your beginning was what? Small. Yet your latter end would increase abundantly. Next verse. For inquire, please, of the what? Former age. And consider the things discovered by their fathers. Next verse. For we are born, we were born yesterday and know nothing. If you are going to use only your information, if you don't get hooked up to what has gone before, do you get what I'm saying here? You will just waste your time on this earth. It says, because our days on the earth are a shadow. Next verse. Will they not teach you and tell you and utter words from their heart? What are those words? They are the waters you grow your own ministry on. Look at the next thing here. It says, can the papyrus grow without a marsh? Can the reeds flourish without water? Next verse. While it's yet green and not cut down, it will wither before another plant. In other words, you can't grow without the words uttered from the heart of the previous generation. Let me tell you, Reverend, this is what God did to me. Because what he said, prophetically accurate. When I started struggling, I just want to show you something. And she alluded to it when she was preaching about your company. When I was struggling, one day God called me. He said, he said, I want to show you something. I said, what? He said, every ministry that is doing well, having impact growing, he said, they all have a point of contact to the city. He said, back then, he said, you know, you were in winners. He said, when they started doing breakthrough meetings, things changed. He said, if you look at... Um, Redeemed, Holy Ghost, he said, show me. He said, Fountain of Life then was in single to married. He said, they started with success. He said, now, what is your point of contact with this city? I said, none. He said, okay, then I want to show you something. He said, there is a principle in the scripture that I knew, which is the law of the firstborn. In other words, when you have a family, the firstborn, and you must never kill the firstborn, if you kill the firstborn, the inheritance of all the brothers and sisters are lost. 
He said, I will raise one person that will be the firstborn. And that one will break through and then show the pattern for the rest. He said, now in all that campus fellowship people were doing, who was the man among all of you that broke out and became firstborn? I said, Reverend Christian Eklobe. I said, what did he use? I said, television. He said, go and do it. The second one he showed me. No, I didn't do it. He said, look again at the ministry. What is the next thing he's doing? I didn't do it. Ministry is not hard, though. <laughs> they are patterns. Once you don't follow it, then you struggle to start. That's why, let me tell you, my leg, head, no matter what that man does, you can't hear me speak against him. Listen, somebody told me in the heat of his crisis, he said, you are the only pastor calling his name in the midst of controversy. I said, you don't understand covenant. Not that I see him. Not that we greet. I've not set my eyes on him, maybe in 15 years. But I'm saying this to you. But you see, when you disturb your house, do you get what I'm saying? And that's why the Bible says, he that troubleth his house shall inherit the wind. When they put you in a spiritual cell, you are part, and you cause trouble and just scat and walk away. When God is trying to show you the map, it's called wandering stars. That's what Jude was saying. That are out of orbit. In other words, you are out of the orbit you are supposed to be. So you are on a collision course. Anywhere you go, you collide with people. Number two, then you must have time where you as a person now spend praying. Now, that's important. Praying in tongues. Where you spend considerable amount of time in prayer and reading the word of God by yourself. So that what you are taught, you by yourself, you see it. Right? Because many people here and just have mental assent, they don't have personal revelation. So you have to stay with the word of God in prayer until you now begin to have revelation. Okay? Now let me give an example of revelation here so you understand what I'm saying. Paul was a scholar. He knew the Old Testament. He knew the Psalms. When the ship was, they had a shipwreck and they were in crisis, Paul said, have an abstain for a long abstinence, it came out. I mean, Paul could have come out and started quoting Psalm 91. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall, all right. Um, I abide in the secret place of the Most High. I dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. I shall say of the Lord is my refuge and be confessing that. And be confessing that. Nobody will have said anything is wrong. But Paul had taken those scriptures to God on security and came back with a revelation. Paul said, I cannot die. For the angel that stood by me told me that I must preach to Caesar. Yeah. He wasn't quoting scripture to us. He was telling us what God showed him. Then he warned them and said, here's the instruction. Nobody must leave this boat. You have moved from the place of generic understanding to personal revelation. That is, and that can only come through you personally spending time alone with God in prayer and reading the word of God. Now, let me quickly show you something. Right? Because nothing happens outside prayer. You know, Paul said this, and let me tell you this, whatever capacity you are in, the Bible says, now you heard what Reverend said, people after campus ministry got cut short. You don't see them again. The Bible says, Jesus has a ministry that continues forever. What that ministry is, is that he ever lived to be making intercession. Once you are an intercessor, your ministry can be caught. If you are doing things on the outside and you don't have a prayer background, do you get what I'm saying here? Once they tamper with that thing on the outside, and I don't care what it is. If you are an usher and you are ushering, but you are not interceding for the people you are ushering. Paul said, God is my witness. He told the church at Rome. He had never seen them. He said that I serve him from my spirit 
praying for you. In other words, the word he used there was that this is not some soulish form of service. It's coming from my spirit and it's prayers. So the first step in serving God is that you are praying first and foremost for people before you do anything. For example, you are coming for a service on Sunday morning. Every single person must pray for the service. Regardless of what you are doing. Even if it's to carry monitors and arrange them. What makes your own service spiritual is that intercession has gone behind that. Because if there's no prayer, an unbeliever can do that. An unbeliever can usher and tell people to sit down somewhere. An unbeliever can fix lights. A non-believer can operate cameras. A non-believer can play a keyboard. But what really makes the difference is that there is that intercession that has gone on. Now, let me quickly show you what happens when you intercede. And that's why a lot of people don't know, say, well, you know, I serve God and I did this. And, you know, the truth has been wrong and everything's good. And, and you've been wondering, look, I've never sought reward from anybody. I told you two churches that I, I said till today they have not come. Nobody gave me a dime. Do you, you hear what I said? Yeah. You ask them, nobody gave me a dime for ministry. I started ministry by asking my friend when we go to the hotel. They said, for one month, it's 1,650. I said, I don't have money. He said, he was working then. He said, I have 1,450. That's how we paid for our first bedroom. I did not collect money from anybody. And I wasn't angry, and I did not expect. In fact, one time I went to Bishop Rickman's office. He said, I said, we will need to buy equipment. And he said, so what's the stage of ministry? I said, I want to buy equipment. He said, so how much does that come to? I said, 120,000. He wrote it down. I said, so what are you saying? I said, nothing, sir. He said, what are you saying? I said, nothing, sir. And I left. That I didn't come to tell you so that you can give it. I said, nothing, sir. And I left. Let me tell you. I left to nothing. I left to the point where we will rent equipment and count the offerings to find out whether we'll be able to pay for the equipment and the venue. And you have one of the most successful people at that point in ministry in the country asking you, what are you saying? And you look at him and say, nothing. When I was on campus, I invited the archbishop to preach. The archbishops looked at us and said, these are my standards, this is what you do when you come. He didn't treat us like a campus fellowship, and I took the challenge. We did everything he was supposed to do. We got into his car. He said, you ride with me to the meeting. We were going. He looked at me and said, young man. I said, yes. He said, I know the amount of money you'll have spent. He said, would you want me to raise an offering for you to get it? I said, no, sir. He said, did you hear what I said? I said, let me raise an offering for you. This Archbishop Benson that I was on. I said, no, sir. Then he turned down. He said, may the Lord God of heaven lay his mighty hand on you and draw you into ministry to join us. He said, you mean I asked you one-on-one -on -one to raise an offering and you refused? He said, may God raise, bring you in. When I finished, I said, I want to go to Canada. He told me, he said, there is a work for you in Lagos. Stay in Lagos, I'm telling you this. Are you following me? Yes, so, when it's time to serve, it's time to serve. Amen. Gehazi's problem was that he went behind to collect money when it was time to serve. It's not a time to use your association with the set man to leverage on things. That's why it's not, that's why Elisha said, take my staff. People know. Listen, don't think you can fool a spiritual person. He said, take my staff, go and put it on a board. He came back, said it didn't work. He said, my staff didn't work. He said, bring it. He went there. He came back. He knew 
there is something you are doing behind the back. If Jesus said, enter into this field, what will take you four months will happen immediately. You are there for ten months. They know you didn't enter any field. Right? Spend time praying there. And I'm going to show you this. And then I'll just give one. I think I've talked about, the, about service there, which is the last one. So I just tell you. Luke chapter 2 and verse 32. Quickly, Luke 2 and verse 32. I'll show this here. Oh, sorry. Let's look from verse 30. Oh, uh, no. Okay, 28. From 28. Try to get. Okay, this is the man. From 26. All right. <laughs> 25. All right. <laughs> I, right. I want to get where it starts. 25. Look to 25. All right. It says, and behold, now this was the birth of Jesus. They took Jesus for what we call dedication in the temple. And behold, there was a certain man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon. I was sitting on here. And this man was a just man, devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26. And it had been revealed unto him by this Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Jesus Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, which means there was no announcement. This man was making contact with the Spirit realm. The day Mary decided to go for dedication. This man that had, and I'll show you, these were individuals that were praying for Jesus to come to the earth. Yeah. The Bible says he came by the Spirit, which means the dedication was about to start. He just showed up. There was coincidence. And it says, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, next verse, he took him up in his arms and blessed him and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. He went on, for my eyes have seen the salvation. Next one, which you have prepared before the face of all people. And then he went on, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And then he said, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then he went on. And Simeon there blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall, rising of men in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken of. Okay, so yes, a sword shall pierce, and the thoughts of many hearts shall be revealed. Next verse. And then he says, Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, and she was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from virginity. And it says in verse 37, it says that this woman was a widow about 84 years old who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day and coming in that instant. One came by the Spirit, she too came in that instant, which means this was a Holy Ghost meeting. When you spend time praying in the spirit, yes. you meet. Are you following what I'm saying here? Yeah. You know, people say, well, you be at the right place at the right time among the right people. How do you do that? It's very easy to say that, but how do you do that? Yes. Are you following what I'm saying here? Yeah. Okay? So it's that. Things have changed because people by chance met. One man, I think it was the Archbishop of Canterbury, he said, someone came to meet him. He said, all these answers to your prayers are nothing but coincidences. He said, but what we have found out is the more we pray, the more coincidences happen, the less we pray, the less coincidences. So we will keep on praying. So if you stay in prayer, coincidences will be happening. If you are an usher and you are in prayer, things will be happening in that congregation that no man can reward you. Do you get what I'm saying? Says that. Finally, all right, like we said, everybody must belong to a company. What Reverend said here was his own company when they were in school. Okay? Now, it's very easy. Let me tell you how. All those people that missed it will get back. They should just study his life. It's not hard. There's no need to be doing fasting and prayer. Just humble yourself. The 
person who was the president of my fellowship left. He got angry, got messed because things that happened, he just left in offense. We started the church, and I told him, I said, look, if I go into ministry, I said, I will carry the inheritance of this fellowship. I said, and I wrote him in England, come back. He said, because I'll go into it, and there might not be space. I don't think he remembers till now that letter. But he told my wife, he said, you know what? He said, anytime I listen to your husband, when I want to do things in our church, and I'm looking for direction, anytime I listen to him, he said, I get it. He said, it's almost like the person I mentored is mentoring me now. There is a law. I told you this firstborn law. That once somebody, if you, if you humble yourself, right, and know that, okay, let's just look at your life and see where did we miss it. It will be very easy, all right, to know that because people come out of companies. Now, every person, now this is what I want to do. Daniel, how did they bring the kingdom of God into Babylon? It was Daniel and his friends, his companions. Look at quickly, just put this up. Daniel chapter 2 from 16 to 18. I'm correct on this one. We won't have to go back and forth. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time. So when they were trying to interpret the dream, that he might tell the king the interpretation. And the next one, then Daniel went into his house and made the decision known to Hanan, Michelle, and Azariah, his what? Companions. When Daniel came back with the interpretation of the dream, the king did not know about the companions. They only knew about Daniel. Every visible minister is a product of the faith of his company. I don't go to much school, but remember Acts. The Bible says when they threatened Peter and John, they went back to their company, told the company what the problem was. The company prayed the Psalms and they asked, God, by the stretching forth of your hands, grant unto thy servant boldness that they may speak the word. By the stretching forth of your hands, signs and wonders should be done. And after they had prayed, the company, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The company. And then Peter went out to preach. And the shadow of Peter was healing the sick. But it was the faith of the company that brought that presence. Listen, you take a fish out of water, its weakness is shown. The environment determines how long and how effective you'll be. I've seen people make decisions, and when I look back now, what happened was they came out of their company. That's all. And the minute they came out of their company, all of their weaknesses started showing. How did you end up in divorce? When we trace it, it was the company. Which means when they were working in power, it was the strength of a company and not the strength of an individual. Paul himself had a company. You see all the revelation of Paul? I hope you know Luke was part of Paul's company. Luke. So you can imagine the quality of discussion that Paul was having with Luke. The perspective on the life of Jesus that Luke had studied. That when Paul comes, he'll say, Jesus said this, Jesus said that. That was how Paul was accurate. It wasn't just Paul. Peter and John returned to their company, right? Let me just read this so you know. Paul also had what? That's why Jesus never sent anybody alone. Paul also put Acts chapter 15 and 22. So you know that Paul had his company. They didn't move alone. Then he pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send the chosen men of their what? Own company to Antioch, all right, with Paul and Barnabas. So Paul and Barnabas, all right, this had their company. And then there's another scripture. So it says, and Paul and Barnabas set sail with his what? Company. It's there. If you put it up, you can find it put up there. They set sail with their own company. So they went in companies. Look, Jesus was 
you know, once I was telling God, you know, <laughs> he told me, he said, you know what? You know, God created everything. He said, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Evaluation. Is God not God? When he created man, he said, it's not good. Do you think God didn't know? That when he looked at it, he said, oh, there's a fault here. It's not good. You know why? One day we were talking about companies, God said, you can't do it alone. He said, even me, we are three. So me, we are three. The power of agreement is what brings divinity. He said, when I said it is not good, it's because I wanted man to forever remember that when he was alone, I said it is not good. Not that he was telling himself. He was telling man, I created you alone. That's why Jesus said, except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It abides alone. But once he's no longer alone, it's fruitful. Listen to me. There is no minister that will fall. That will fall. Adultery, anything. If He's open enough to tell his company, there are motions inside me for that woman. Pray it out of me. Yeah. He will not fall. Yeah. And what defeated us, let me say this, in our concept of word of faith, we wanted to be strong men of faith. And we had the perspective of being strong individuals by ourselves. So what does that do to us? I'm a man of faith. Whosoever, I. So here's what happened. God says, if all these aces, let's say this kind of ace, this massive one, we had 10 here. And then we went into this area and said, look for the 10 strongest men. In this area here, let them come and take away the aces. And the 10 men come strong. Of course, they have to show us that they can do what we can do. So what do they do? Each one goes for each AC. So carry it because that's to show that I have strength. So many people are doing things by themselves to show I have faith. If they finally take it out, it will take so much time. They will have blisters. They will, they will say we are never going to do that again. All right? But if they came in and said, guys, hold it. Ten essays, ten of us, let's humble ourselves. Five of you go for one, five go for one, bam, it's out in one minute. Five go for one, five go for one, bam, it's out. They will do that same work, they will be faster, and they'll be fresh. When you are doing it in a company, there's longevity there. When you are doing it by yourself, do you get what we're saying here? So make sure you have that in your company. Right, which means you go back, you have any issue, the company, what does the Bible say about this? Sit down together, go through the scriptures together, get revelation together, balance yourself with the revelation there, pray things into the earth together. Are uh, you following what I'm saying here? And move with that company. And when you want to make decisions, if you have to detach yourself from that company because of a job, because of something, know that that company must cover for you. If you are going somewhere, you are no longer around them. Until you can find another new company where you are to reproduce that environment again. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes, Father, in the name of Jesus, let your wisdom rest upon these people. Open up their eyes to see the great work that you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen.